Hi, this is Alex Scott, a member of LANDS, and I'll be presenting this edition of our weekly update. Um, before I continue, I'm just asking if you can please check out our website, and that's at jalands.org, or you can follow us on social media, our Twitter handle is at LANDS underscore JA. So first we'll begin with the environment. We'll be picking up on an issue we started with last last week, and that is the Dry Harbor Mountains issue. Um, over the past week, there were two really interesting articles in the papers, the two papers. Um, in the Observer, there was an article titled Dry Harbor Mountains Mining Not Worth Environmental Risks, while in the Gleaner, there was an article titled Dry Harbor Mining Deal is All Legal. Now, the one titled Dry Harbor Mining Deal is All Legal was penned by the lawyer representing the company hoping to do the work. And the other one titled Dry Harbor Mountain Mining Not Worth Environmental Risks was titled by a social commentator seeking to halt the works. And some interesting things came out of those letters. Um, now, firstly, with the lawyer's letter, um, in a very roundabout way, he was explaining that everything relating to the project was above board, and he painstakingly listed the process that the company had to go through in order to get the sign-off. Um, this letter has been supported by other statements that the project is going to bring in a good deal of money, approximately $635 million Jamaican dollars, while also providing approximately a hundred jobs. The social commentator, on the other hand, noted that the economic gains would be greatly outweighed by the losses if even a fraction of the possible negative effects, if even a fraction of those did happen. Um, some of the things he noted was the potential deforestation and the destruction of the mountains with no hope for restoration of that mountain once it's been mined for limestone, gypsum, and all that stuff. And that, I think, comes to the heart of what we in Lands have been discussing for some time, and that is the line between development and sustainability. Basically, sustainable development. And that is saying that at some point, uh, development needs to take a back seat. It needs to be sacrificed for nature, and that nature, at some point, needs to be left alone undisturbed and untroubled. Now, it may very well be legal to go ahead with the developments, but as the recent showers, which have destroyed um, many roads and communities of the past few weeks across the island have shown, um, any benefit that, that this mining project could potentially bring would be greatly outweighed by the costs, and we're seeing that as the the potential benefits are currently listed at, I believe, $635 million, while the damages over the past few weeks' rains that have destroyed roads and um, left people out of pocket have displaced communities. Um, the bill is now coming to a total of, I believe, $2 billion. So we are seeing already where any potential benefit would be immediately offset by the costs. That is a point that was made by Dr. Damien King, um, an economist who we don't generally have much agreement with, but in this instance we do find ourselves sharing common ground. And he was making that statement, as he was making that point rather, as he was rebuffing statements along the lines of, we should all be happy with this potential mining project due to the benefits that could accrue from it. Now, another thing is that we often feel like these issues, the environmental issue, is a rural issue, it's a country issue, um, or it's an issue that's not going to directly impact us unless we're going to country or we're driving through bauxite country. Um, but that's not really the case. And as an economy, as a national economy, which really depends to a really large extent on tourism, and again, as a country which habitually gets battered by tropical storms. Thankfully, not so many hurricanes, but a lot of tropical storms. Um, destroying a coastal mountain 
could seriously impact the tourism industry but it would also have a serious negative impact on the persons who currently live on the north coast and who currently work on the north coast any toppling of the mountain or destroying of the forest up there could seriously put them at risk now this is also a creeping issue it's a creeping issue in that the lands which are in discussion the lands which are you know um, being talked about right now they fall within that gray area in the cockpit country boundary and if this mining were to go ahead then that is one more reason that everybody all the mining companies that want to mine in the border areas of the cockpit country have to go ahead and do the mining or press for the mining now if the mining in the cockpit country area were to go off on a massive scale then at that point we would have serious issues potentially with our water with our water supplies we would have serious potential issues with our biodiversity and we could have serious potential issues with our physical security we would be threatening our water supplies in uh, potential poisoning of our water runoff or depleting of or underground water resources would be threatening our biodiversity because the cockpit country is one of the most densely biodiverse areas in the country and we would be threatening our physical security because not only is water needed for life as everybody knows but if you destroy the forest then you are inviting landslides and mudslides and flooding and other physical um, threats which would be affecting us and for those reasons we really think that some halting that a definite halt needs to be put on the project in the dry harbor mountains the next item is dealing with housing and it comes from the Gleena. There's an article titled No Easy Fix for Squatting, says Charles. Um, this is an issue I think every young Jamaican has had on their mind at least some point in time recently. And it's perfectly understandable because access to housing is such a, such a difficult issue. Now, recently the state minister, Colonel Charles Jr., had said that addressing the issues of squatting is a harder task than first imagined, and this is due to the multiple factors which lead into it. Now, this acknowledgement has come on the heels recently of the British High Commissioner making similar comments in an interview with the same papers with the Gleenham. Now, while the acknowledgements are welcome, we can't help but think that these acknowledgements should have come earlier and that they should have known about these issues a long time ago and acted on them. Um, the hindrance to proper housing, um, they've, they've long been known and they've been listed as price and location among other things. And these are issues that have been constantly highlighted by many groups, including ourselves. And potential solutions have been offered by these groups, ourselves included. Now, it's interesting that this squatting issue ties in with the age-old issue of land reform. Now, it ties in with land reform because again and again we are seeing where a minority of Jamaicans have access to land which could be used for a plethora of other things, be it housing, it could be agriculture, it could be industry, while the few, while the, while the many, I'm sorry, have to scrounge for for land and in their variably squats or end up in congested cities. We have to begin building more affordable housing. It's clear and it's obvious that we have the developers and we have the manpower and we have the technology to do it because we see dozens of expensive housing lots going up across the corporate area in Kingston. Housing must be made accessible to those who are not just working at high flying jobs but those who are working at or below or above, just above the minimum wage, those who are just leaving school, for example. And it shouldn't simply be accessible to those, like I said, who can afford it the, the, the most. Now, the problem with access to decent housing is that it can only go hand in hand with sustainable and practical development. This is something we've 
been speaking about earlier and this means expanding where you put your jobs currently you see a lot of jobs most jobs actually they're restricted to a single belt in the Kingston and St. Andrew area of parts of St. Catherine that's on the south coast and then when you go on the north coast it's generally restricted to the Montego Bay area we need to expand where we put our jobs to other parishes in doing so this would mean that we'd be easing the burden on Kingston we'd be easing the congestion in Kingston we'd be lowering the housing prices in Kingston and we'd also be providing um, affordable housing solutions to a broader population because they'd now be working closer to home now what you see now is because all the jobs are located in one concentrated area you have people living in that concentrated area so Kingston and St. Andrew for example all the jobs are there so everybody works I'm sorry everybody lives there and because everybody lives there the rent prices and the prices to buy real estate go through the roof um, if we were to expand where we put our jobs then the prices <laughs> for these places would actually fall because there wouldn't be that heavy a demand um, another thing that would be addressed if we go on if we expand where we put our jobs therefore building where we put our buildings um, the there would be formalized settlements and with formalized settlements be it through design or natural attraction you get the amenities which are currently sorely lacking in these informal communities amenities such as medical facilities fire services police stations hospitals um, schools all these things which are missing at the moment you could actually address if you went ahead with a planned form of, of housing development and the only real form of planned housing development we're gonna have in this country we think is with some form of of land reform and then a practical and common sense approach to where we put our jobs so that this this unnecessary burden on on housing especially in the Kingston area is, 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 is eased now we move to the economy and this is an article that was carried in the Jamaica Observer titled BOJ warns of worsening labor market conditions um, recently the BOJ announced that they expected the unemployment rate to rise from the current standing of 12 percent to anywhere between 13 to 15 percent over the next year that's between 2021 to 2022 now an interesting thing to note from this piece was that while the unemployment rate has risen from 10 percent to 12 percent over the corresponding period where they've done this survey they found that 10 percent of the potential labor force has disappeared now what that means is that um, over the course of the last survey and this survey 10% of the persons who were surveyed last time saying that they are looking for a job or they would like to have a job they are no longer looking for a job that is very troubling it means they have literally stopped looking for work for whatever reason um, one of the reasons given for this massive spike and this massive expected spike in unemployment is due to the COVID-19 pandemic which has left a lot of people out of sorts out of work um, underpaid and all these things and this is predicted to get worse um, before it gets any better globally and as a result the BOJ is projecting that we, we should be looking to be getting a bit of pain on that front the rate of unemployment and underemployment in this country is something we as a group have spoken about. Um, this is something we feel could be addressed with greater investment in value-added manufacturing in among other areas which complement our current strengths. So that would be in areas such as agriculture and possibly even pharmaceuticals. And this could be made possible by a government which prioritizes local industry and seeks to give it preferential treatment as it gets off the ground.
Um, this preferential treatment wouldn't necessarily have to come in the form of money, but it definitely would need to come in the shape of protecting that local industry, especially that local manufacturing industry, as it seeks to get through its teething pains, while you can also ensure that the Jamaican worker is well remunerated and has a stable and long-term job. Um, we are a left-wing movement, we are a socialist movement, but we are also a nationalist movement and we believe in the development of Jamaica. And in that vein, while private industry, even local, would be looked upon with some suspicion, it would be grudgingly welcomed as it would mean a form of long-term stable jobs which pays the Jamaican worker well. Um, in that regard, we see where we have the BPOs, the call centers, and we have other forms of foreign investment coming down here, and the Jamaican worker has no rights they have, or very limited rights, I should say. They have very poor remuneration, and the job stability is very insecure. So we really think that in that regard, uh, focusing more on national industry and national investment would beat the benefit of the Jamaican work and would help to alleviate the unemployment and the underemployment we're currently facing. Um, before we wrap up though, one more thing. Uh, November 25th marked the fourth anniversary of the transition of Fidel Castro and we at LANDS um, just wanted to pay our respects there. Uh, over the course of the week, there have been events put on by the, the communist, um, the, the young communists of Cuba, and we've had the pleasure of, of attending, we've had the pleasure of, of, of meeting virtually um, our left-wing brothers and sisters and, and learning about not just Castro, but the revolution in Cuba, the internationalism, and everything they have to offer. And... And um, I really think it's important that, that before we close, we just, we just um, remember the, the achievements of the Cuban people, of the Cuban revolution, because it, it does act as a template, as a signal, as a sign that we in the third world, we can do it. We can stand on our own two feet. We can walk tall. We can have pride in ourselves that... that the people can run the show, that we don't need to be deferring to our quote-unquote betters. Um, that if given the tools and given the time, then yes, the masses do know what they're doing and they do know how to do it very well. So, again, um, long of the Cuban Revolution. And this again is Alexander Scott, a member of LANDS. This has been your lands weekly update.